Well, the beards are the expression of protest and a certain kind of dress. After a short time, they become a convention themselves. So, a person who wears a beard and dresses in a certain way is stamped as a radical for himself, just as a man who goes to church is stamped as a pious man for himself. It is not required, he is not put to the test how much he really changes, how serious, how deep his new conviction really is, or whether there is any new conviction aside from that which is in his in his, uh, in his head? head. I would suggest, for instance, that if those who really are serious would, uh, that those could do something quite different, not beards, but be so concentrated on the new, the, on the new attitudes, new human attitudes, new human relatedness, um, that they look different for anyone who looks at them, that their posture is different, that their language is different, that they do not antagonize people simply because of the newness and strangeness of their outer, outer appearances. It's being free, isn't this what the whole concept of doing your thing is about? Yes, but it's, a, it's in many ways a childish way of being free. Uh, it's, uh, the real problem is uh, how can you acquire that independence and freedom and show it in yourself and demonstrate it to people by your attitude? That's not the attitude of hate. That's the attitude of great independence, of great courage, of sober reasoning. Compare, for instance, what the Czechs and the Russian uh, leftists do in their fight against Soviet conservatism and reaction, uh, they are utterly objective. They do not argue from hate. They are realistic. They see what the situation is, but they show tremendous moral courage. They are impressive. They do not unnecessarily antagonize people because they know that if there's any chance for a change, they must carry with them a large amount, or at least a considerable amount, of public opinion. Therefore, they cannot afford just to antagonize, but uh, they can afford and must afford to show that they are different. Let me throw this out at you. The young people of the new, new left, particularly uh, those who are perhaps on the extreme of this movement, um, claim that they are revolutionaries and that to make a revolution you don't first educate the majority to want the, re the revolution. A revolution can be made with a minority. Therefore, it is not necessarily important whether you antagonize over small things like beers and clubs. Well, what, um, all this problem has been discussed very thoroughly by two great revolutionaries, by uh, well, one great revolutionary by Lenin in, from 1917 on until the early 20s. Um, and Lenin would have called this just adventurism and phrase making. Of course, it was the idea of Marx, it was the idea of Lenin, that you can make a revolution only if it's not a putsch. If you have behind you if not the actual majority of the population, but potentially the majority of the population, if this majority will be behind you tomorrow, the idea which then later was developed by Stalin, namely revolution by terror, was an idea which is of course uh, in contrast to Marx's idea of revolution, it is in contrast to the original ideas of Lenin, who started his revolution because he was convinced that Germany would have a revolution. And then this German-Russian revolution would really have a majority of the population behind it and would be a viable socialist society. But to um, consider a revolution uh, in which uh, one assumes that uh, a small percentage of the blacks and a small percentage of the students will overthrow and conquer the um, 
uh, government of the United States. It's just childish. And uh, let us say Marcuse, as far as I can see, also says that uh, this is not possible. The idea that uh, one can make a revolution when the majority of people are against one is just uh, uh, at best romantic, unreasoned, unrealistic. It doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and leads only to strengthening of the military or fascist forces in a country. I should like, however, to make the footnote that I think most of the new left uh, do not want to make a revolution. Uh, I think uh, that most of them are sufficiently intelligent to know that there is no possibility. And uh, in that sense, I think uh, Marcuse is a spokesman for many who really does not believe in the possibility of a revolution. It seems, however, that they do not have any alternative. That is to say, they see there is no possibility for revolution, but they do not see what else could be done to prevent the drift of our technological society into either war, nuclear war, or into the complete technotronic society, to use a word by Professor Brzezinski, in which man becomes entirely a cog in the machine without feeling, without individuality, without conviction, without even any thinking beyond that which is necessary for the routine of performing a job. <clears throat> and this is indeed the difference between my own position and that of many of the new left uh, in many ways my own aims are not very different from what many of the new left have expressed, namely the aim of a participatory democracy, of a tremendous activation of the citizen in, participation, in his participation in the political process, in the industrial process, in every enterprise in which he is employed. Um, in other words, I believe that we must change our bureaucratic pattern in which the individual is irresponsible because he has no responsibility, because our whole system is a bureaucratic one which does not give the individual a responsibility, that this needs to be changed. Furthermore, that our pattern of consumption needs to be changed, that the force feeding of the individual with commodities which leads to this passiveness must be changed, and that means the pattern of production must be changed. Um, that means that uh, investments must be made in the public sector, and that high ta and uh, the only way to do that is high taxation, which would enforce much less, um, much less uh, consumption in the private sector. The, but all these questions are questions which are never. Uh, 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 discussed, I try to uh, discuss in the book, for instance, the question that our whole economic scheme is ever increasing production. The idea that at one point one could stabilize production doesn't even occur. Now it's perfectly true even in a rich country like the United States, we don't produce enough for about 40% of the population, but we produce too much for about another 40% of the population. We waste. We must begin to discuss the question. Can we visualize uh, the economy in which there is a limit, a ceiling to the increase of production? And then it means that our sense of hope, of future, of happiness is not anymore the chasing after the idea, the dream of ever increasing consumption. But in addition, I believe that all these things will not help unless we are aware that in order to live 
um, productively, one must have aims and values. And to come to grips with what the individual really aims at, what his values are. Indignation and protests are in themselves very valuable, but they are not enough. It's also not enough to be...